Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to our guests from all over the world, as you can see in the chat box, uh, with a special welcome to the survivors and their families that are with us today. I'm Ronit, and joining me is Yaron. It is truly heartwarming for us uh, and for the entire team at the Ghetto Fighters House Museum to see such a diverse and engaged audience. We're grateful for your presence here today. Today, following a sleepless night and a tense day, we confront a growing sense of uncertainty in Israel. But despite the challenges in these circumstances, we stand firm. We remain committed to our mission more than ever, especially as we approach the 75th anniversary of both the Ghetto Fighters Museum and Kibbutz, happening actually this week on April 19th. Antek Zuckerman, one of the founders, once said, and we will see this quote later on a slide, we emerged from shattered walls and came here to build new walls, new homes that pulse with life. After the events of October 7th that have left permanent marks on our hearts and minds, we believe that the strength and resilience of the founders are a sorely needed source of renewed inspiration to all of us. The events of October 7 and their aftermath have sent uh, shockwaves through the global community, as Javi Dreyfus, as Professor Dreyfus uh, said, and will say soon, deeply influencing discussions on Holocaust remembrance and education. In today's program, which we called the Holocaust and October 7th, entangled memory, question mark. We will try to explore various aspects of their possible interconnectedness, we will ask how can the events and the memory of the Holocaust inform us and influence our understanding of October 7th collective trauma. And we hope that this program will resonate with you in meaningful ways. Now I would like to invite Yaron to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Onit, so much. So our first speaker for this event is Professor Javi Dreyfus. She will delve into the key challenges facing Holocaust studies both in Israel and worldwide amidst the aftermath of this tragic event. Javi, uh, please be our guest. Thank you very much, Yaron. Thank you very much, uh, Ronit. It's a pleasure being here. Okay, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. And I, of course, uh, am thankful to Lochmei Getaot, uh, to Bet Lochmei Getaot, and to all the other partners. And I must admit that when I gave the, the title for my lectures a few weeks ago, uh, Holocaust Studies and Commemoration Amidst Ongoing October 7th Challenges and Connections, I did not dream that we will meet less than 24 hours since more than 300 missiles were sent to Israel. Thanks God this attack was not successful. Of course, uh, thanks to the, the acts of the IDF of you know, and of all our many friends, United States, Great Britain, France, and Jordan, all who stopped those missiles. Uh, although we must remember that a seven years old be uh, Bedouin girl was severely wounded. And I think we all share our thoughts and our prayers with Amina El Hassouni and hope that she will be better. But uh, those last 24 hours are different in so many terms from October 7th, and they still exemplify that we are on an ongoing event. For many Israelis, uh, this uh, October 7th have not ended. We're still in this occasion. And I know that things are seen differently uh, from the, uh, in the world, but I would like to refer to how we re receive it here in Israel and to its effect on Holocaust commemoration, study, research, and education, as it was just said. Now, I think we should all remember, sorry, I wanted to show this uh, before, and I would want to refer very shortly to the impact of those uh, events uh, on October 7th on research, education, documentation, and commemoration, although I will not mention too much documentation because we will hear later on from Ohad about uh, their interaction between the Holocaust and what happened and the documentation of October 7th. I would want to raise here, or at least uh, try to present here, that this is a two-sided phenomena. It's not only how the Holocaust might 
uh, shape the way that we refer to October 7th, I think we should also ask ourselves how October 7th changed the way that we discuss different aspects of the Holocaust. And here we must say very, very clearly that October 7th is not the Holocaust and the Hamas are not Nazis. Moreover, we must say very clearly that the Holocaust was an extensive and multi-dimensional event geographically and chronologically, and certain aspects of it are disconnected from our con contemporary reality. I mean, I'm not sure if we are talking about gotization, legislation, liberation, partisans, marking of the Jews, deportation, or camps, our understandings and the way that we will refer to those topics will be different now after October 7th. But there are topics within the Holocaust that I think we refer to them here today a little bit differently. It's not only ideology, it's also the feeling of helplessness, the question of murderness, memory and commemoration, rescue and fighting and other aspects that I would like to refer. So the topic of the Holocaust and its many different faces did not change, but in many terms, our audience, our friends, our colleagues did change or at least their understandings did, did change. And what I want to do in the less than half an hour I still have is to refer very shortly to three main themes, ideology, murderousness, and memory and commemoration, and refer to different questions. As you can see, I already presented here fighting, rescue, and helplessness, because one of the questions that today people who are dealing with commemorating and remembering the October 7th in any aspect that one can think of, if it's a Memorial Day, if it's a museum, if it's a memorial site or anything else, the question is what kind of story do we want to tell? How much do we give to the fighting, to the rescue? How much do we give to the helplessness? And I will refer to this later on. But, but what I want to do is really, uh, first of all, say very clearly that October 7th, Mark 2023, marks the bloodiest day in Jewish history since, October, since the Holocaust of European Jewry. Sorry, I just need to, something is bothering here me in, the, in, in my own computer. So I apologize for that. During long and agonizing hours, more than 1,200 individuals endured merciless killing. Civilians, spanning from elderly to children, men and women, were forcibly abducted, and both men and women fell victims to awful acts of sexual violence, while thousands of others suffered various injuries. The intensity and the savagery of these, those events evoke immediate, immediate parallels of accounts and imaginary resemblance of the Holocaust era. This prompt researchers, institutions, and organizations involved in Holocaust studies and education to confront the questions of whether the atrocities we witnessed in the southern part of Israel on October 7th can be co compared to the experience endured by Jews during the Holocaust. Now, here I must say that as historians, we always compare, although we don't equalize, when we compare different events, we want to uh, shade light on some similar similarities and refer to different differences. Although aiming to get uh, all, all of this is in, in hoping to gain a deeper understanding of the past. So we all the time compare in Holocaust studies, we compare the, the experience of Jews in Eastern European countries to Western European countries. We ask what did Lithuanian Jews share with the Jews in the Netherlands and many other aspects. So one of the things that we have to remember that when we put those two events, the Holocaust and October 7th side by side, those are clearly very different phenomenons. But yet, there are some aspects that at least present challenges when we speak today about the Holocaust. And as I said, I want to refer first of all to the ideology. Now, one of the problems that we as scholars and as educators we have today is that we're dealing with, when we're referring to the Holocaust, we're dealing with Nazi ideology in a world where the cries to murder Jews or to annihilate Israel became some kind of normalized. And in one hand, on one hand, we must to, we must emphasize the differences between the Nazi ideology 
and different Islamistic. It's not the Islam. It's a very radical representation of the Islam that is calling to the annihilation of the destruction of Israel. But we have to refer to the resemblance and to the differences. Now, indeed, indeed, both both uh, both ideologies uh, refer to the view of Jews or those who are identified as Jews as mortal enemy while justifying acts of violence against them, disregarding any moral norms and any rule of warfare. But there are fundamental distinctions between the two. Nazism, and I'm sure the audience here that already saw many colleagues and friends from many different places, was a racist ideology that referred to what we call today redemptive antisemitism. It was grounded in pseudo-biological racist theory, and it, prior, prior, it gave priority to the annihilation of the Jews above everything else. Now, this should be remembered, but we should remember also that the Jews were considered as a biological threat to humanity and that their presence could not be tolerated. Unlike other forms of Jewish hatred or anti-Judaism uh, that called to many different alternative solutions as forced conversions or deportation, Nazism worldview advocated for the complete obliteration obliteration of Jewish existence, both physical and spiritual. Now, what we see today, and unfortunately what we see today from, it doesn't matter if it's from the Hamas or Hezbollah or Iran, is a very specific uh, 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 interpretation of the Islam, which is rooted in religious belief rather than in a rational, rational ideology. And each objective is to establish a global order based on Islamic law and here I'm citing many friends and colleagues who deal with antisemit uh, with Islamic Islamistic antisemitism. It could be Jeffrey Erf and Meir Litvak and many others. And they already showed that in course, contrast to what was grasped in the past as Muslim uh, uh, dominance, uh, much of those radical interpretation see today as some kind of humiliation. Humiliation is that is perceived by the Western back Israeli control over Muslim holy sites, and especially in Jerusalem and the holy sites in it. Now, this brings to this uh, need to, to fight against the West, as well as to undermine what they grasp as traditional religious, religious structures, uh, uh, with concept of enlightenment, liberalism, and democracy. All of those are things that this Islamistic ideology want to fight. Now, if we will have time, we could refer more about and refer more, more widely about this uh, uh, ideology. But what I want to say that this is very different of the Nazi one. The problem is that when we talk today about uh, Nazi antisemitism, this might echo, especially among our friends around the world, some of the phrases heard outside of the classes themselves. So one of the problems that we face in Holocaust education is that we're talking about that past, but some of the phrases can be seen as if they're referring to what is happening outside of those classes. So although there is a very great differences between Nazi ideology and Islamistic ideology, one of the questions that we will have to tackle in the, in the future is how do we refer, for example, to the antisemitism within Nazi Germany while there are such a raise in antisemitism uh, around the world? And of course, this can raise many different aspects. It could be that we will talk more about what is called progressive antisemitism or about Islamist, uh, Islamistic antisemitism. But in any case, talking today to students and to uh, uh, in the universities or in classrooms, in school classrooms, about the hatred to Jews is different because what is happening outside of the classroom. So that is one aspect. Another aspect that I want to refer to, and again, the Holocaust did not change, but the atmosphere and the environment in which we refer to the topics did change, is a question of murderness. Now, today we know that 
the murder of the Jews during the Holocaust did not happen only in the camps. Today we know that almost 2 million Jews were killed in shooting pits. And to know we, today we refer to the Holocaust as a European project. We know that so many other people took part in it. Uh, in the in the in the in in um, the harassment of the Jews and in trying to help the Nazis throughout all of Europe. Now the problem that we have about talking who is talking about the murderous acts of the Nazis during the Second World War is that today many of the images that we saw during October seventh might resemble they are not identical but might resemble what happened in the Holocaust. And here I must be very, very clear. Unfortunately, in October 7th, nothing was invented. Invented The cruelty and the physical, sexual, as well as a, a, a emotional a torture of the victims is something that we could see in other places during the Holocaust as well. What might be different is the way that the people, the perpetrators, refer to this violence during the Holocaust and in the last few months. In the Nazi regi regime, we have to remember that the acts of violence were considered as an unwritten and never to be written page of glory in our history. And here, of course, I'm referring to uh, Himmler's famous speech before senior SS officers in uh, Poznan in October. Uh, 4th, 1943. Now, acts of cruelty were committed by local population, but many times they were seen in, with disgust by the Germans themselves. And we know that although sexual violence against Jewish women was officially forbidden during the Holocaust, it was, it occurred, a high, it, it occurred widely and among our, our friends here today is Dalia Offer, who is one of the first scholars who referred to this uh, a question of gender and Holocaust. Now, although Nazi Germany deemed those atrocities ideologically necessarily, it recognized that it would be perceived as amoral. And this is why they used so many uh, um, um, terms as the final solution, resettlement and special treatment, trying to hide what actually was done. In contrast, during the events of October 7th, all forms of viral violence were not only permitted, but were actively presented and encouraged, which many times those acts were serving as a tool of terrorism. Uh, the fact that uh, they used the communication, we'll, we'll hear maybe later from Ohad, and they put them on real time in various networks, uh, social networks, many times gave more awareness to what happened uh, during those awful hours on October uh, uh, 7th. So there was a use of social media platform that many times give, gave a different uh, understanding during the events himself, uh, the, the events himself. And I want you to remember that sometimes videos depicting act of murder and abuse were circulated on victims' Facebook pages. And another thing that we must remember is that while we're speaking here, we still have 133 hostages hostage held in Gaza. Unfortunately, we know that not all of them are alive. And as difficult as it might sound, we must remember that even right now, some of them might be suffering sexual and physical abuse. And this is something that is very, very difficult to endure. So one of the questions that we are now trying to understand better is how do we refer to Holocaust studies after October 7th? We are just a few weeks before the Israeli Memorial Day for Holocaust, for the Holocaust. And the question is, how do we refer to those events in order to understand better, not only October 7th, but to understand better the Holocaust? And I think we have here two different uh, aspects. On the one hand, we have the fear of what happened or what might have happened. And we have, of course, a great sadness because as I said, at least for Israelis, October 7th have not ended. On the other hand, what we might have, and this is something that we might consider enlisting, enlisting is that we might have less judge, judge, judging of the victims of the Holocaust 
and more understanding. And here I might, I must say that I think that in the past, when we were talking about the Holocaust, many times we had to convince our viewers, our audience, that those atrocities really happened, that those are not only a metaphor. And one of the problems that I think that we are facing today is that on the one hand, uh, we, and we could be Jews or Holocaust talk scholars for decades, we were very successful in making the Holocaust um, symbol for the humanity in general. It's not only an issue for Jews, it's not only an issue for Israelis, but we, the Holocaust became a watershed for, the, for humanity and for people all over the world. The problem is that many times it became dis disconnected from the actual historical events and became mainly a metaphor. And when it became mainly a metaphor, when people are facing atrocities, they are comparing it naturally to the greatest catastrophe they can think about, and that is a Holocaust. Now, I want to be very clear. As Holocaust scholars, we never argue with Holocaust survivors. And I think we must remember that we don't wish to uh, argue with survivors of the last atrocities which happened in Israel. And many of those survivors used terms of the Holocaust. We have Holocaust survivors who endured those atrocities one more time, and they said, I felt again like the Holocaust. We have people who are much younger, and they said, we felt like in a pogrom, or we felt like living in the Holocaust. Um, somebody, there is this in the Israeli radio, somebody that is repeating and saying, I am not, um, uh, I, I was not rescued, I survived. This is the term in Hebrew, Nitzol and Sored. And she said, I survived to tell the story, which of course resembles what many Holocaust survivors said. We survived to tell the story. And as our friend uh, Moshe Schneer said, we cannot uh, criticize anybody who used Holocaust terms since the Holocaust had such a powerful part in humanity and not only in Israeli and Jewish uh, understandings in the last few decades. But what we must do, those who are not Holocaust, or, Holocaust survivors or October 7th survivors, is to try to understand the differences and the similarities and to try to understand how we can enlist our new understanding to know better not only what happened on October 7th, but also what happened during the Holocaust. And here I want to return for a second to my presentation, and I know that I should uh, finish very soon. And I want to refer to those different aspects that I mentioned before. So ideology, um, as I said before, or maybe I should say clearly, I think that, uh, Ronit mentioned it before, that October 7th, was really a breaking point for many, but it had different dimensions. For Israelis, and there are many different kinds of Israelis, and for people around the world. I think that for many people around the world, one of the great challenges that we have is the fact that we're talking about anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism during the Holocaust, or anti-Semitism today, when this term became approved in so many different societies. And we know that there are many different societies in which calling to a, from the river to the sea became something which are each is legitimate. Now, it is not compared to Nazi ideology, but it echoes things that frightens many. Murderness, we know that the murderness Murder, murderness is always awful, and the murderness during the Holocaust was different in so many dimensions, and it didn't refer to it here, but of course, we have to remember that geographically and chronologically, the Holocaust was, of course, something that happened during years in which Jews were helpless, not only for a few hours, but for uh, many years, and that there was no military force that was trying to help them or cooperated in order to help them. 
So again, the murderness was very different, but it echoes things that frightens people today. And I think that we can already see today how memory and commemoration can drive, drive different aspects from the Holocaust. We will hear later about documentation, but also the question, and I've referred it to the, in the beginning, whose story are we telling? How will we be able to tell the story of October 7th, not only of those who were abducted and not also only of those who managed to survive, but also of the many victims. And there are many different stories here of the kibbutzim, of the people who celebrated in Nova and were murdered there, of the different uh, uh, um, uh, cities nearby. Where will we start the story? Well, where will we end the story? There are many different questions which we cannot answer here. And I think that one of the things that we Holocaust uh, scholars must uh, talk about is not only how people dealing with October 7th can gain knowledge from the Holocaust, but what can we, we, sorry, what, what can we scholars who deal with the Holocaust can gain and learn from October 7th. And referring to those different aspects, I think that we have many things that we can and should remember. And I think that our great challenge, challenge uh, is still the way that we can get above or at least uh, uh, face the sadness, the fear, and the different uh, um, threatening voices and how we can manage to enlist the understanding and the fact that those many people are now less judgmental about those facts. I also think, and that will be my last point, I also think that we have to remember that for many, the fact that, the, the fact that Israel was and still is in such a great threat, the fact that so many different powers organizations are calling to its destructiveness after the Holocaust gave put us in a very difficult situation because for many who felt that after the Holocaust, the fact that Jews are should be secured and should be allowed to live in different places, there is a big question mark for many and this is something else that we will have to understand better. How do we enlist it for a better understanding of October 7th and of the Holocaust? I must uh, end with one apology, which I wanted to start with, but I, I, I feel that I forgot it and I feel that I must mention it now, that like many other Israelis, uh, I am after a sleepless night, and I hope that still I managed to refer to the main question that I wanted to in this short time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javi, for your really interesting and wonderful uh, uh, talk. And uh, I just want to share that uh, in the chat, uh, the, uh, people raised a few questions. Maybe, uh, well, maybe I'll I'll just uh, take one of them because uh, I'll I'll tell everyone that in terms of the Quran and Islam, I don't think maybe that uh, will go there. But uh, we have the question of Agnes about, uh, I'll try to rephrase it as a question, uh, if it was a religious anti-Semitism, uh, why is it targeting all Jews everywhere? Question mark. And afterwards she says it's more a political anti-Semitism than anything else. So what are your thoughts about anti-Semitism now and then and the connection or disconnection between these two phenomena. Okay, so first of all, uh, there are different scholars, I mentioned a few names, who deal with Islamistic antisemitism. And as I said, I think that despite the similarities between the Nazi ideology and the one that we can see today, and it doesn't matter from the radical Islamist of the Sunni or of the Shi, there are many different, many great differences. Okay, now 
um, if somebody would have told me uh, more than a half a year ago, before October 7th, that uh, the struggle here in uh, Israel is has some anti-Semitic aspect, I would have said the same. I would have said, well, you know, this is a political conflict, there are different understanding and so on. I, I think that this is something that is very difficult to say after October 7th. And I can say of, about myself, about my own experience, although the Hamas charter, charter is uh, in English and Hebrew and many other languages, I never thought of reading it. And I never thought that the calls calling to the true uh, extermination of uh, Jews is a real one. October 7th changed that, but, and this is a great but, the Hamas, the Hezbollah, and Iran are a specific radical a, a interpretation of the Islam. It is not the Islam. It is not the whole Islam. And that anti-Semitism is different of the Nazi anti-Semitism. The Hamas are not Nazis, Iran are not Nazis, and whoever is trying to do some kind of equalization of those two different uh, uh, regimes or ideologies is actually trying to enlist the, the, the situation today and Holocaust studies to his political views. So I think we need to understand better anti-Semitism. I think we need to understand better Jewish hatred. I think we must be very, very careful in trying to ascribe Islamistic interpretation to all of the Islam or to our all of uh, 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 our neighbors and or anything else. But I think we speak about anti-Semitism different today than we spoke before October 7th. By the way, if, thank you so much, Javi, but I just want to maybe clarify a bit uh, the questions, and now there's an, a new one from Veronica. Uh, is the October 7th event mainly directed to Jews or mostly to the state of Israel? And maybe it's not only about anti uh, Islamic anti Semitism, but maybe also in a more uh, general context uh, uh, of, uh, of the world at the moment, uh, if you can see a new type of anti-Semitism emerging in the past half year, uh, something new, something old, uh, something different. Okay, so I'm sorry, I didn't uh, read it. No, 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 your, 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 your answer so, was wonderful. Uh, uh, um, uh, so I'll say again, unlike what many people think, this specific radical Islamic, Islamistic interpretation started before the state of Israel was established. There is an argument against, among scholars of, Islamis, of this Islamistic uh, anti-Semitism about, for example, what was the impact of Nazi Germany ideology about its, uh, on its uh, development. Some of those scholars said it had much influence, others see, sees, as, sees this Islamis, Islamistic interpretation just as we talk about Christian modern anti-Semitism, there was Islamistic modern anti-Semitism. And this has to do not only with Israel, but with Jews in general, as we could hear in the last few months, meaning that the Jews are seen as those who are promoting Western values as democracy, as liberalism, as enlightenment. And those voices are seen, are, are seeing those values, those Western values as values that are threatening the Islamic world. Actually, this specific inter interpretation is not only against Jews. And again, it's not only uh, Israelis, but it's Jews in general, but it's also against Muslims who are not holding this radical uh, ideology. I want to remind you that on October 7th, it wasn't only Israeli Jews who were killed, but also there were a few uh, Bedouins as well as uh, Israeli Arabs who were also killed, and of course, other foreign, foreign citizens. So it is very easy and convenient 
to see it something that is referred only to Israelis. But unfortunately, as we could hear from worldwide uh, um, meetings in different places, the call is not against Israel, or at least not only against Israel, but against Jews in general, since they are seen as those who are who are, are promoting those aspects. And if we are looking at what would have been the the final goal of this radical uh, uh, um, ideology in this framework, framework, Jews should be punished for humiliating the Islam by governing the the holy places and so on, but they should bring the Islamistic uh, rule to all the places that in the past were under Islam rule, including in Europe. This is why it's much more than Israel, it's much more than Jews, and I hope that now I managed to answer the question. Thank you, Javier. Let's continue to own it. Okay, um, thank you, Javi. There are many more questions. We will try to address some of them uh, towards the end of the meeting. Our second speaker is Dr. Ohad Ofaz, co-founder and head of a documentary at uh, Edut 710, stands for um, the 7th of October. He's an award-winning international filmmaker, film scholar, and senior lecturer at Oranim College of Education, specializing in video testimony projects. Dr. Ofaz serves as a, as a filmmaker in residence in the Vlog Fellowship at the Fortune of Archive, where he co-directed The Listener. This documentary follows the life of Dr. Um, Dori Laub, a, a psychiatry, um, psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor who in, uh, initiated the first video testimony project to document the testimonies of Holocaust survivors. Dr. Ofaz will explore the evolution of the audiovisual testimony tradition from the Holocaust area with an emphasis on Laub's uh, attentive and empathetic interviewing techniques to the Adut 710 initiative. He will highlight the influence and modifications of Laub's ethics of listening as a core concept in this project. Ohad, the stage is yours. I will share my... Uh... <clears throat> My presentation. Okay, um, thanks uh, Onit for the introduction. It saves me quite a bit from uh, explanations. Um, I would just say that Edut 710 is in English uh, uh, testimony 7th of October and that uh, it is a venture uh, collecting eyewitness testimonies um, of the 7th October atrocities. And that um, the documentary aspects and uh, production processes of this uh, project is based on ideas and practices we learned and brought from the history of film testimony uh, that is uh, deeply rooted in the memory of the Holocaust. And as you understood, there is a, a key role for of uh, Dory Laub's uh, concept and approach to testimony, um, in my in in my thinking and uh, also in the project, uh, I want to say something about this photo, which I uh, um, sy symbolized for me a, a, an important uh, moment. Um, it was taken during a, a testimony workshop. Uh, where uh, Doi Laub, um, who was uh, Ronit mentioned, uh, initiated the first uh, video testimony uh, project. He was a psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor himself. So he came to Oranim College to teach my student and myself the what what I will call the art of listening. And as you can see here in this uh, picture, I'm on the background. Uh, helping um, one of my students solving a sound or a, a picture problem, video problem, uh, while uh, Lau and all the other uh, participants are 100% uh, uh, focused and attentive in the uh, student that is uh, 
giving her testimony here. I think Laub knew almost nothing about the technicalities of filmmaking. And the technicalities of filmmaking are very important. But I think the lesson that I learned from him in this session and later on of being 100% uh, attentive is uh, one of the first, uh, for me, one of the first laws of documentary filmmaking and especially of uh, uh, testimony. Uh, of uh, people like those uh, su who survived the uh, the Hamas attack of of seventh uh, of, of October, and since that meeting that was taking place in uh, two thousand eighteen, that became also the, my first lesson to my uh, to my students and also to myself. I mean the 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 lesson of of uh, of attentive uh, listening. Before we dive into the parallels or what we learned from Holocaust testimony in uh, in the project of Edut uh, 710, I would like to begin with uh, uh, with the testimony of Nir Kaspi that, for me, um, uh, symbolizes or or shows or is showing the the some of the important patterns of this uh, and aspects of our project. Shomishim nasim nikanes, kilo shomim ha'achor et ha'chalon shalanu shal ha'shrochit, nishbar ha'chalon shal ha'mirpeset. Ve'achshav, gam lo ispaknu la'avin ma mikam alam, ve'toch rekat shomat she'esh malay anashim betoch ha'bayit. Ve'dabrim ba'aravit. וגם לא יעזנו לזוז בשלב הזה, שני ילדים כבר היו ערים, לא יעזנו לזוז כי על המיטות יש נגד פיפי, סדין נגד פיפי והוא עושה מלא רעש. אז יצא שחיבקתי את הילדים על המיטה, אדם מחזיק את הדלת נורא חזק, אף אחד לא מעז לזוז, אפילו הכלבה הבינה שאסור לזוז, אסור, היא אפילו לא הלחיתה מרוב, ש... מרוב המצב הדרוך שהיינו כולנו. בעצם הם מנסים לפתוח את הדלת. אדם מחזיק את זה, אין לי מושג איך הוא הצליח, אבל הוא החזיק את זה ממש חזק, שהידית אפילו לא זזה. אז כנראה שהם חשבו שיש איזה משהו שמחזיק, ואני לא יודעת למה, הם פשוט פוסחים עלינו, כאילו, ניסו, לא הצליחו, שומעים אותם מבלגנים עוד כמה דברים בבית, ואז יצאו. וכל פעם מישהו כותב, הם פה אצלי, וכזה, לא, הם פה אצלי, לא, הם פה, כאילו, זה בא מכל כך הרבה חזיתות, שאת אומרת, כמה הם, כאילו, בואנה, זה, אנחנו קיבוץ קטן. שבע חמישים ושבע, זו הודעה אחרונה שאימא שלו שלחה, תשמרו על עצמכם, אני אוהבת אתכם. ואז הוא אומר לי, ניר, כאילו, מה כבר טוב יכול לצאת מזה? אני אומרת לו, תראה, גם אני שלחתי את ההודעה הזאתי. להורים שלי, לחברים, גם אני שלחתי את ההודעה הזאתי. אולי, לך תדע, כאילו, הוא אומר לי, ניר, לא, היא לא נכנסה לוואטסאפ מאז. עוד משהו שאותי מאוד הלחיץ, אני באזור... שמונה בבוקר קיבלתי הודעה, עדי התקשרה אליי, אמרה שירו באימא ושהיא לא יודעת מה לעשות. אמרתי לה, התחבא בארון, אבל חייב לחלץ אותה כי אני לא יודעת מה קורה שם. שכן, הצליח לחלץ את הילדה. ליז לא הייתה בחיים. שהוא, הוא היה ממש צריך להזיז את הגופה שלה כדי לפתוח את, ה... את הדלת. ומאיר גם הבנתי שהוא ראה שאיפה שהוא היה, שזרקו רימון, שזה לא נשאר שם יותר מדי. כן, <אח> אבל לפחות הצילו את הילדה, <אח> בת שבע. באיזשהו שלב, אין לי מושג באיזה שעה זה היה. הם עומדים במרפסת וצועקים צה"ל, צה"ל, מי בבית? החלטתי שאני דופקת על החלון ברזל, גם זה היה מאוד מהוסס, ומזל גדול שאיך שדפקתי היה בום, כי שנייה אחרי זה, את שומעת, מדברים בערבית, בערבית וצועקים אידבח אל יהוד, אידבח אל יהוד. אחרי עוד... אני חושבת שזה היה באזור החצי שעה, 40 דקות. עוד פעם שומעים אנשים נכנסים לבית, והם צועקים משפחת סולטן, משפחת סולטן. עכשיו, יש לנו שלט משפחת סולטן בכניסה. כולם יכולים לראות את זה. אמרתי, בואו נקשיב. אין להם פי. אם יש דיבורים, נשמע את הפי. ואני מקשיבה, והם צועקים, תביא את הרימון, נזרוק על הדלת, כי הם ניסו לפתוח ולא הצליחו. תביא את הרימון, נזרוק על הדלת. לא, אל תביא את הרימון, משפחת סולטן פה. בליל של... משפטים, אני אומרת, איפה הפי? <laughs> למה בכל מילה שאומרים, אין פי? חשבתי <laughs> שאני דופקת על הדלת, ואז כולם אמרו, שקט, 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 יש פה מישהו שפותפיקות, רגע, שקט, משפחת סולטן, זה אתם? אז אני אומרת לה, אנחנו מפחדים. 
ואז הוא כאילו הבין, אז הוא אמר, מפחדים, 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 מפחדים. שאיזה מזל שבחרתי במילה הזאת, כי יש בה מלא פי. <laughs> זה מצחיק, אבל באמת זה היה איזושהי כזה... סוג של נשימה ראשונה שלקחתי, והרגשתי את האוויר נכנס, מה שכל היום הזה לא באמת הצלחתי להרגיש. וכשהגיע הבוקר, אמרתי, אני חייבת לעשות טלפונים, לברר מה קורה עם ההורים שלו. מתקשרת למנהל קהילה, יואב, ואני אומרת לו, יואב, תקשיב, אנחנו חייבים לדעת, גם אם אנחנו יודעים את התשובה, אנחנו חייבים לשמוע את זה רשמית, אנחנו חייבים... זאת אומרת, את, את יודעת את התשובה. אז אני בעצם נכנסת לחדר שלה לאדם, ואני אומרת לו... שלצערי זה המצב. ושהודיעו לי עכשיו רשמית. חוויה כזאת משנה אנשים. מאוד מאוד איחדה בינינו. אז, אז אנחנו נאחזים בזה, אנחנו נצמח מזה. אנחנו ניקח את הכאב ונצמח ממנו, ממש ככה. זה כואב, זה יישאר. אני גם, בפועל, אנחנו מאוד רוצים לחזור לחולית כשיהיה אפשר. ולחזור לגור בבית, אבל שוב פעם, כאילו במידה ויהיה שינוי ובמידה ויהיה לנו את הביטחון ובאמת נוכל, רק כשנגיע נוכל לדעת אם באמת נפשית אנחנו יכולים להיות שם. כי זה להסתובב בשבילים שמזכירים הכל, את כל האנשים שאיבדנו. is is um i think uh it, it portrays the the uniqueness of uh, edut 710 because as you can understand no other uh media channel would be interested to listen to an, uh, an hour and a half to someone who just survived in the safe room and most of her story is the the rightness of And, uh, and the worries to her children and trying to hold the door. It's not an item. And I think that our uh, members, those who listen for an hour and a half, gave the, the space to Nir and to many others uh, that, that otherwise wouldn't have the, the stage to, to tell their story in their own words. So our, our main goals are to um, listen and record the stories, uh, as I said, uh, with no interruptions, which means there is no directions. I put my ego as a film director aside and others, like there are some uh, Holocaust uh, uh, experts and uh, history scholars, we all put aside the, 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 the ego and... We try to, as much as possible, uh, uh, hold our questions to the, to the last stage of the interview. We only frame it very much in the, in the um, uh, following the ideas of Laub, the methods of Laub. Uh, uh, we just uh, ask them to introduce themselves because we would like to meet with the person, not with the event, and then to tell something about the week Uh, the days before the attack. After that, they tell the story of the attack uh, until they uh, fled from, from the battle zone, usually with no, hardly any time even to breathe. Although some of them ask us to, to, to raise questions, and so there is no place to, for question. And this is very important that they would lead their own uh, testimony. Um the other uh, the other thing is that it's very important for us, and this is also this presentation is it's it's part of this goal is to uh, to have the testimonies presented to uh, to wide audiences. and for that reason, we have to uh, film and record uh, a high quality uh, sound and image. 
the the third uh, goal is to establish uh, uh, not only a website but also a digital uh, archive. So from the first uh, stages, we were trying to index uh, um, the testimonies and after the the interview to to raise questions uh, that will help us help uh, uh, research and uh, film projects uh, in the later stages. I want to go back to the uh, tradition of, of uh, testimony in film. Uh, in the upper uh, left side, we see uh, testimony of uh, Mietek Doltheimer in front of the camera of uh, uh, George Stevens, Hollywood film director John S George Stevens, who led one of the um, filming units uh, during the, the liberation of the, of the camps in Germany. And what is special is that because most of the of the images and of the filmed images we have from this period are mute because it was very difficult to uh, record sound. Stevens, especially in the in uh, in in the field, Stevens um, insisted in on bringing uh, the the truck with uh, uh, sound equipment and to listen and to interview uh, the, the, the survivors. Um, and in this, I think he and also who, those who came after, after him uh, understood the, the, the merits of, of, of film uh, as, as a tool, as means to to bring testimony to wide audiences, to bring the, the personal story. Uh, the, um, that film, uh, the Stevens, uh, what Stevens uh, and other uh, from, from the filming unit uh, filmed, uh, you, uh, was used also for the, um, during the Nuremberg trial and the, and later on uh, in 61, during the Eichmann trial, once again, uh, film testimony um, linked with, with, uh, with uh, the, the juridic uh, uh, purposes of um, when they documented the, the trial on every uh, media and means and broadcasted it uh, all over the world. Um, one of the climax of this uh, of this uh, development of testimony is, of course, Claude Lanzmann's uh, Nine Hours Shoah. Um, Lanzmann was so dedicated to to uh, the purpose of uh, historical uh, uh, demand for justice that he and also his followers and also i am in the I, I can say about myself in in the first uh, films i did we were so dedicated to bring testimony in the most profound and convincing way that we were pushing the 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 witnesses sometimes over the limit uh, tackling with their traumatic memories and in this of course Lau uh showed me and others uh I, another uh, possibility uh laub initiated the the his project with with other partners on the late 70s uh, and i think his i can say the his mission was to enable as many uh, survivors as possible to have the possibility to become from a survivor into a witness to to take a stand he in his writing he also describes uh, i think brilliantly the setting of the testimony interview and more specifically the uh, role of the listener the interviewer uh, that might become even a co-owner owner of the trauma um for him, the listener has to be a companion in that journey to the traumatic memories, since the most uh, um, 
profound damage of this kind of trauma is the loneliness of the survivor. And the fact that when he, the survivor, uh, the survivors go back to the memories, they go through the, the trauma again, but this time they have someone with them. And I think that lies in the core of, of uh, Laub's idea that we try to uh, integrate in Edut 710 um, concepts of documentation. So the principles are uh, that, as I said, every survivor, and I, and I think many thousands of them, there were, I think, uh, uh, more than 60,000 uh, inhabitants of the uh, Western Negev uh, during the attack. I think most of them were in the safe room, just frightened. 20 hours, 30 hours, we would listen to everybody. We won't select the special uh, stories. We would like to, to get to as many uh, population, different populations as possible, different settlements, kibbutzim, moshavim, towns. Uh, we have also uh, Bedouin uh, uh, testimonies. Uh, the teams are responsible both for the, the, the uh, condition uh, of the of the um, survivor, we're not uh, therapists, but we have some therapeutic uh, um, uh, uh, aspects, or not aspects. I would say um, we 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 take in consideration the situation, but they are also responsible for the quality of sound and image. And I have to say some of the communities like Be'eri community, uh, they wanted us to take the, the, the testimonies because we kept both sides of, of uh, testimony. Uh, every publication of testimony depends on the witness's consent. We ask for consent in the beginning, but also later we come back because maybe they were in a situation that they weren't uh, focused enough on what they agreed on. So we come back after editing and we ask again for their consent and we change uh, the editing if they they would like to. And we will also take the, the film down uh, from our website if they would ask. Uh, we edit in two uh, versions, uh, a full version, just clean uh, from uh, any uh, interruptions, if someone got into the room or something like that, and a five-minute excerpt, uh, uh, selected excerpts from the uh, testimony in order to, to reach wide uh, public so the wide audience and viewers can get a sense of the uh, of the, the testimonies experience just in five minutes and consider to watch the full version. Uh, we uh, Edut Seven Ten is uh, um, cooperative, independent cooperative uh, media initiation. We have, uh, um, as I said, scholars, documentary filmmakers, therapists technology experts. Up until now, we collected uh, more than uh, 700 uh, testimonies, including some testimonies, more than 100 other testimonies that were kept inside uh, um, communities that wanted to, kept, to keep the testimonies and not share it yet. Uh, 250 were edited, text, video, two versions, some also in English, not too many, unfortunately. Uh, 200 were published, and we're now getting uh, to the stages of development, research, and film and art project, which are, in our uh, perception, uh, are the, the higher levels of, uh, of testimony. I want to um, I want to go back to uh, what um, Kelly Oliver 
uh, wrote about uh, Laub's uh, Laub's concept of of testimony in her book Witnessing Beyond Recognition. Kelly Oliver, feminist uh, philosopher, and she points out the importance of Laub's ethic uh, and describes describes how Laub's listening enables the survivor to recover to recover their broken selves and gain control and agency over the traumatic experiences of the historical atrocities. Um, she writes that by this, Laub emphasizes the uniqueness and the importance of the subjective experience of the survivors being as important as historical facts. Edut 710 follows Laub's concept of testimony in the sense that it is a humanistic ethical gesture of documentary film and media makers and scholars um, towards the survivors. This human humanistic notion comes across to, through the screen and to the viewers. Uh, and I believe that the viewers can sense uh, and identify with the compassion of the listeners. It is a documentary form that may become an, an antidote to the poisonous forces of media of terror that we saw taken by Hamas on October 7th. Uh, um, and I hope that uh, um, it might work this way. I want to conclude uh, with inviting you to, um, to go and watch the, the, the the internet uh, site and to subscribe the newsletter and we are i i would say that we are looking for uh, resources to keep this project alive for many years because there are uh, um survivors who didn't uh, don't have the courage to speak yet we have to be here for a few years uh, we have to take care of the of the material, it is very important to we edit the the um, when we bring the communities back the 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 edited uh, testimonies. Uh, they accept it with great with uh, um, gratefulness, and we have to to keep on this process for a long time. Thank you for a, an insightful and very interesting talk. Um, I'd like to, to use uh, Marilyn Sinclair's question um, and look into the motivations. Uh, first, she's asking whether you're collaborating, working together with organizations like the Shoah Foundation. And I will add, uh, if you can um, put a spotlight on the main, on what motivated you at the beginning? Was it just, you, you mentioned, and I, I leave your talk thinking about the loneliness of the, um, of the survivor. Um, but in addition to the therapeutic uh, intent, is there any uh, motivation of historical significance or advocacy or what was the combination of those motivations and, and, and Marilyn's question about the Shra Foundation? I, I would like to say, first of all, about Shoah Foundation, um, we didn't really cooperate. I mean, the, there are quite a few initiations. I think Edut 710 is probably uh, the, the, the bigger one. I mean, in terms of the uh, members and in terms of the quantity of, uh, of uh, testimonies. Uh, and I think uh, Shoah Foundation collected uh, like 400 and they uh, stopped for now. Their mission was more, I think, uh, to bring it to American audience. Most of the, or at least half of the inter uh, testimonies were taken in English, which, are, which is not the native language of the, of the survivors. Um, so we are connected, but we don't work uh, together. We are more uh, in uh, in partnership with the Fortnoff Archive in uh, in Yale, which 
as you as as I told uh, as was was told before, um, we learned many of the uh, aspects from uh, and regarding your questions about uh, your question about the mot motivation, I would say yes, yes, and yes. I mean, it's we're not a we're not therapists. There are therapists in the organization. I'm not a therapist, and there is sensitivity towards the condition of the of the survivor but i can't promise anyone who come to 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 testify that it will heal or that my attempt is to heal and uh, uh, two weeks ago or a few weeks ago i uh, joined an interview of uh, one of the kibbutz uh, uh, guarding units local units uh, he is definitely one of the heroes of this event. Um, uh, they fought with uh, with they with hardly any weapons. They fought against so many terrorists. And he declared in the in the beginning of the of the testimony that he suffers from uh, uh, post traumatic uh, uh, syndrome, and he knows that after this testimony. He would he 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 wouldn't be able to sleep for quite a few nights, and that um, that what happened. I mean, he he couldn't um, he didn't expect this uh, this um, testimony to 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 make it any easier for him. But he decided, for the sake of history, for the for the sake of keeping. Uh, the lesson of bringing the lesson forward. And with this, we could be with him and we could try to make the, the, the harm as less as possible. I think in, in, in the general or in the, in the big uh, picture, it might help to as and this, I, I quote uh, Laub himself, it might help next generation it might it it gives also uh, it helps also the communities. So it's not only personal. All, all my children came back. It's uh, holidays. I don't know if you hear them in the background. Uh, so the motivations are also some kind of uh, um, recovery. I would say uh, not only the personal level but more of the society. It's also for history, for research, and also to in order to bring the 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 testimony to wide audiences, also abroad. Um, testimony is all, always something that is against denial. So I hope I. Yeah. I uh, and my second question, but we'll need a quick answer to move on with our journey here. Um, as a professional in trauma documentation, did this project offer any fresh insights um, or fresh perspectives? And this connect to the last comment here on the chat that many Holocaust testimonies were recorded years after the event. And how do you think that the immediacy of the recording now of these testimonies affects? So try to combine both into a one minute answer. And make it short. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, well, um, I would say that nowadays it's not possible to wait so long. People were testifying to their own to, through media, uh, social media, from the safe room, and and then if they testify to social media, it keeps them in this loneliness that is so harmful. So they need someone to listen. And we encountered so many um, testimonies just out there in the on the internet. We felt that we have to be there. On the other hand, it was our motivation as filmmakers, as teachers, as scholars, to to listen to those people and to 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 have their uh, own words. We we. Um, we got the advice of of trauma uh, ex experts, and we built the 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 interview in another way than what 
because what Dory Love had to do was to bring uh, the the survivors, the Holocaust survivors, back to their subjective experience. We didn't do that because it's it's another era, and people talk more, much more subjectively. And but we didn't ask about emotions. We uh, put the main focus on the narrative. Let people organize their memories into a story and that's the main concept so if they bring emotions it's okay but we don't ask like i do ask on on documentary filmmaking or if i i i would ask uh, how did you feel or what what was the harshest uh, moments for you i wouldn't ask it on testimony um on the other hand i would ask what would give you hope or uh, what gave, gave you strength? I would try as much as possible uh, keep it on the positive side. <laughs> I would put it in sim simple word. So was it a minute or? Thank you. Yes, that was <laughs> okay. really interesting. And thank you for taking us through this journey between witnesses and, and memories. And we will conclude our journey together here with my colleague, Yaron Tsur. Um, who will talk a little bit about uh, the museum education world. Yaron is the Director of Content Development and Digital at the Ghetto Fighters House Museum, and he will share the museum's educational approach to addressing questions that have emerged since October 7. He will reflect on key messages that we convey to visitors who come with whatever we here share and have in mind. How do we deal with what comes to our museum today. Yaron. Thank you, Monit. And uh, I will be taking the last, uh, I think, uh, 10 uh, minutes uh, left, I think, of, uh, of this event. My uh, short uh, presentation is called Holocaust Education at This Moment in Time. Uh, thoughts, Dilemmas, and Challenges Following the Events of October the 7th. And I think that the main thing that I want to begin with and say in terms of a uh, Holocaust Museum is this is a pedagogy information, meaning that we have much, much more questions than answers. Uh, we find ourselves, I think, very humble in terms of that we still don't have this perspective of, okay, this happened uh, a while ago and now we have we know uh, where we're going. We do have a few uh, assumptions that I'd like to speak about, but I think it's really important to say that uh, in terms of creating a, a pedagogical concept, I think that it will still uh, take a while, and I think that it should uh, take a while to get that uh, historical and educational perspective. So first thing um, is that what are the implications of October the 7th on our visitors? I think that's one of the main questions uh, we as educators have been asking ourselves uh, since that moment in time. Uh, we've been meeting uh, visitors since then, uh, many of them young visitors in high school and soldiers and students and teachers and uh, adults and other uh, audiences. And we've seen a shift, okay? Now, it's not that it, I can pinpoint and say, this is the shift, okay? But I think that there are two things that we've been noticing as educators. One, uh, a shift in, uh, in worldviews, in values, in, uh, in terms of uh, maybe going a bit uh, to extreme, okay? Again, this is not something that I can generalize and uh, we need to see much more, but we can see this uh, at the moment and since that uh, there is a shift uh, in terms of uh, my point of views about uh, the other side, 
about what should we do as a nation, what which what should we do during the war, uh, what are my point of views about uh, Arab people, uh, racism, anti-Semitism, and so on. And the other thing is, uh, I would try to characterize it as hope and maybe sometimes lack uh, of hope. And I'd like to say a few words about that. And the question that we ask ourselves is, what should be, what should be our educational response to uh, what we see and, uh, and, and what happens during the guiding process uh, when our visitors arrive at a Holocaust museum. So first thing first, uh, as you know, our museum was founded by Holocaust survivors, who many of them took part uh, in the uprising in, in 1943 and were in the Soviet Union. And at the end of the war, uh, begins this debate, okay? And I took these two handsome young men to show and uh, to try to reflect uh, on that debate. Yitzhak Zuckerman, on one side, one of the founders of the museum and the kibbutz, Abba Kovner, on the other side, uh, one of the leaders of Hashomer Tzair in uh, Lithuania, later on a partisan, a poet, uh, a remarkable uh, human being. Now, uh, Lublin is one of the first cities to be uh, liberated in Poland. And there, these two uh, leaders of the youth movements meet, and there's a conflict between them. And I want to sh uh, read this uh, from uh, Yitzhak Zuckerman's uh, point of view about this conflict. The meeting with Abba Kovner's group in Lublin was fateful. Differences of opinions and assessments were found between us. They, the group of Abba Kovner, came to the conclusion that the whole world is murderous and all the Jews are victims. The conversations with them lasted days and nights. We thought that we should leave behind a group in Poland, large enough to, that will be able to organize the Jews released from the camps. Yitzhak says, we should not only li not live only with the matter of revenge, but also education. They, Kovnil's group, did not see in front of them the Jews who survived the Holocaust, but only the destruction, which indeed was. They were driven by their desire for revenge. So rebuilding and revenge are two motivations uh, after the Holocaust be among many Jews. And the point of view of, of our museum uh, through the eyes of the founders of this place is they chose rebuilding on revenge the day after. They chose to help the refugees, to help the children that needed to be taken in because many of them were orphans, to bring thousands, tens of thousands of them from Europe to Palestine and later on Israel and to build a kibbutz and to build a museum. Those motiv motivations are building as something new out of the ashes. Abba Kovnel, which is someone that I really uh, respect, he said at uh, the day after that his motivation and his friends is of revenge. And it's something that we uh, bring upon when uh, with our visitors, by the way, not not only in the last half year, but in general, the DNA of the of our founders was rebuilding. And these we think are two different motivations uh, after catastrophe. And from that point of view, uh, if you go to Poland today to the city of Warsaw, where the ghetto was, you'll see this very small monument near the wonderful museum uh, called the Bet Monument, which is the second letter in Hebrew, as you all know. And this was uh, uh, created by Yitzhak Zuckerman. The Bet in Hebrew is the first letter uh, of the Bible, Bereshit. And that 
was there saying, we need to find our Bereshit, our new beginning, the day after catastrophe, Holocaust, the death of our families, of our nation, the loss of our home, everything. What are we going to do now? And their choice was to rebuild. Bet to me and in our museum is something very inspiring. And it reminds us, and I think, and that people, even after the worst things that can, people can imagine, can uh, rebuild their lives and new society with new people and new dreams. And this is something that we found during the last half a year that it's so, so crucial to uh, speak about with our visitors in terms of hope. Rebuilding is possible. It's not only possible, it will happen. We need to find that strength, those motivations, and to, to find ourselves, to find our bit uh, in 2024. Uh, and it takes me back to what Ronit said in the beginning of this event. We emerged from shattered walls, shattered walls, and came here to build new walls, a new home that pulse with life. Okay. And you can see the GFH Museum, our museum, where I'm sitting right now, and the kibbutz right near it. And that's their saying uh, to uh, after uh, the Holocaust. And I think that is it's so relevant and so inspiring for people today. The second thing that uh, I'd like to say a few words about is that we have uh, a many programs in our museum for visit. One of them is called, I Light My Little Lantern to Seek a Human Being, uh, a poem by Hannah Sernish, uh, who paratrooped in ha Hungary, I'm sure that you all know her story. And the idea that in times of catastrophe, in times of war, in times of Holocaust, to still be able to seek human beings, that is something that we want our visitors to be known when they come to our museum. We want them to think about human choices. We want them to think about good and evil. We want them to know that during the Holocaust, people were making choices all of the time, okay? In the camps and in the ghettos, and even Nazis were making choices. Everyone were making choices because humans are not good and they're not evil. They make choices all the time. And this is something that we want to delve into uh, with our visitors, and I think that today it has become even more uh, crucial to our visitors to speak about and to think about and to reflect about uh, human choices between uh, uh, in times where you can easily uh, stop thinking about them. You can easily say, well, there are times for human choices and there are times for wars and there are times... We no, we want to, especially in times like this, we need to remember humanity. We need to remember human beings, uh, whoever they would be. And here I'd like to uh, maybe end with uh, one of our uh, founders, Chavka Folman Rabban, uh, in, um, in one of the ceremonies in the kibbutz, one of the closing ceremonies in the in the Holocaust day, and the things she said to young people in who were in the audience. Ani pona le dora tsayir le eile she yivnu et atita aretz azu veyatzvu et achevra ba lano she saradnu achofe shaya kashé vemachiv. לחזור לחיים ולהתחיל הכל מחדש נראה כבלתי אפשרי כמעט. עזרו לנו האמונה והתקווה, ושבארצנו החברה תהיה צודקת, מוסרית, טהורה 
ובה יישמר צלם האדם בכל התנאים והמצבים. I'd like to take the last minute to just say that I think that uh, one of the things that we've been speaking about in our museum that we need to remind ourselves and we need to remind our visitors, especially our young visitors, that in times like this, thinking about what it means to be a human being and morality and moral dilemmas are even more important. And, and in terms of, uh, they're, it's, it's all, they're always important, okay? But right now, uh, we can see that it's very much needed uh, by everyone. And I think that uh, by younger people uh, specifically. And uh, I think that's one of our greatest challenges at this time, uh, hope and humanity. And I think that those two aspects uh, are something that our museum, because of what it is and who it is and who were the founders of this place, it's, it's just almost natural uh, in our museum for us uh, to be there and to talk about that. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, Ronit, if there is any yes, last questions, uh, last question then. I'll be I more wanted than... to thank you for your inspiring um, words, empowering. Um, in a way, you circled back to a question that was posed to Javi asking, and maybe we'll really end with Javi's uh, response to that. Is it still relevant to talk about the Holocaust after October 7th? Uh, so you provided uh, a very powerful answer. Javi, if you would like to refer to that before we thank everyone and... Um, and end the program. I will just uh, add my thanks to Yaron and to Ohad, and I'll just say that uh, I think we cannot prevent, we cannot stop talking about the Holocaust and the people who endured those years are have the right that we will talk about what they survived and what they, uh, what happened to them during those years and those who did not survive. And Havka following Rabban words are important uh, reminders to all of us of what they could take from those awful years. And we are uh, wise to that as well. Thank you. And I leave asking, but we'll leave that for another time, what you, what you, mentioned, what you uh, referred to when you said that as a Holocaust scholar, there are things that you're now looking at uh, based on October 7th, but that's for another talk. Um, and I really want to thank everyone for being here today uh, for our wonderful three speakers. And I wish everyone uh, peaceful days ahead and Passover happy as much as possible. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you all.